Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This is arguably one of the most famous lines from an already famous movie, Silence of the Lambs, as stated by Dr. Hannibal Lecter, I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Now, on the surface, this statement appears to really just demonstrate how much of a psychopath Dr. Hannibal Lecter is. I mean, he murdered a census taker, ate his liver, and then also whipped up some fava beans and a side of wine with that. However, there's so much more to this statement as it's really a medical joke. And of course, in this video, being at Catalyst University, we are going to explain the biochemistry of that medical joke. A couple things to remember before we go into that. Remember that Dr. Hannibal Lecter is just that. He is a medical doctor, thus his title. And prior to being imprisoned for basically cannibalism, he practiced as a psychiatrist. So the biochemistry we're about to look at, he would very well know. Now we really have to have a basic understanding of this metabolism right here before we look at the liver, the fava beans, and the Chianti. So there are chemicals within the body called monoamines. Uh, these can range from neurotransmitters to hormones, and they include things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin would be another example. Serotonin is actually shown down here in the bottom left. And like anything, if we have a way to synthesize these compounds, we also have to have a way to degrade them, to get rid of them, right? So here's the basic idea up here in the top left. We start with a neurotransmitter that's classified as a monoamine. These monoamines, as you can see right here, on their alpha carbon, or what was their alpha carbon, they have an amine group. And so there's an enzyme here called monoamine oxidase, MAO, and they come in two types, monoamine oxidases A and B. And what these enzymes do is they basically convert this amine right here, specifically this carbon, into an aldehyde. Okay? And then the aldehyde that's produced is either reacted with an aldehyde dehydrogenase up here, which allows the formation of a carboxylic acid, or that aldehyde reacts with an aldehyde reductase, and it converts that aldehyde into an alcohol. Okay? And these two compounds right here, the carboxylic acid and the alcohol, are going to be excreted through the kidneys. So this is a way for neurotransmitters to be degraded, all right. That also allows their activity to be terminated in the synapse where they're acting. And then also that metabolic end product can then be excreted renally through the kidneys in urine. So let's take a look at a specific example down here to get a grasp of this reaction pathway. So right here, this is the molecule serotonin. Serotonin is, of course, a neurotransmitter that we typically think of as being uh, the happy neurotransmitter. It's associated with feelings of happiness and well-being. Now, when serotonin needs to be degraded, one of the ways it can be degraded is through this enzyme, monoamine oxidase. And monoamine oxidase is going to convert this carbon amine right here into an aldehyde. As we mentioned, that aldehyde can then react either with an aldehyde reductase, which converts this aldehyde into an alcohol, or it can react with the aldehyde dehydrogenase, which oxidizes that aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. Now the names of these particular metabolites are irrelevant here. The major thing to understand is that the alcohol and the carboxylic acid can then be excreted by the kidneys. Um, also of note, these monoamine oxidases are localized primarily in the mitochondria of cells, both uh, monoamine oxidases A and B. Now monoamine oxidase A can act on serotonin, as we just showed right here, and it can also act on catecholamines, and catecholamines include epinephrine, also called adrenaline, dopamine, norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline, tryptamine, and then tyramine. We're going to come back to tyramine in just a minute. It turns out that tyramine actually plays a role in Dr. Lecter's medical joke. And then monoamine oxidase B can also act on these catecholamines, and also a couple others that we don't really see a whole lot of. Those are benzylamine and phenylethylamine. So that leads us to talking about tyramine. Tyramine is a monoamine that's derived directly from tyrosine. 
It actually requires tyrosine reacting with an enzyme called aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. It decarboxylates this compound tyrosine to form tyramine. Now, generally speaking, tyramine is a vasoactive monoamine, meaning it acts on the vasculature to do various things. Now, normally, its concentration is kept pretty low by the aforementioned pathway, but it's going to act on the vasculature and cause increased blood pressure. However, if we have a lot of tyramine present, then we might end up with excessively elevated blood pressure, so acute hypertension, and that can also lead to pain. Additionally, excessive tyramine can cause cerebral vasoconstriction. Obviously, vasoconstriction in the brain is bad because it leads to ischemia of those tissues. That obviously leads to problems. Now, eventually that tyramine will be degraded, and so that initial rush of tyramine that caused this cerebral vasoconstriction will be gone, and you'll get what's called rebound vasodilation, which is a compensatory response to that vasoconstriction, but it overshoots the amount of dilation that you actually need. That can lead to migraines. Also, excessive tyramine can cause nausea, visual abnormalities. So the whole point here is you do have a little bit of tyramine, and it does have a natural function, but excessive amounts of tyramine are not good. Now here, this is just the degradation pathway for tyramine. It's exactly what we saw before. Here's a monoamine oxidase. This would be either A or B. It doesn't matter because as we saw before, both classes are able to act on catecholamines and certainly tyramine falls into that category. Now monoamine oxidase converts this tyramine into its corresponding aldehyde, which is actually termed parahydroxyphenylacetaldehyde. And then this aldehyde compound can react either with the aldehyde reductase, which reduces this aldehyde to an alcohol. This compound would be called tyrosol. Or this aldehyde can be oxidized into a carboxylic acid via the aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme. And this specific compound would be parahydroxyphenylacetate, or parahydroxyphenylacetic acid. Now, why is this clinically important? This is important because there's a balance between the amount of tyramine that we get and the amount that's degraded. Under normal conditions, we, of course, want that to be balanced. Any tyramine we make, we want it to be able to be degraded. If we start building up more and more tyramine, we're going to exceed the ability of these enzymes to degrade it, and so we're going to have an accumulation of tyramine, and it's going to cause these things right here. So what would cause an accumulation of tyramine? Well, there's really two things. The first is the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, I won't go into details here, but they are used in the treatment of certain psychiatric conditions and personality disorders. Okay, So if you take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, this is a medication that inhibits monoamine oxidase. Now, if you inhibit monoamine oxidase, are you going to be able to degrade tyramine? No. So that's one thing that will cause tyramine levels to become elevated. So anyone who's taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor runs the risk of tyramine levels going up and up and up, and it can cause these problems down here. Now, why is that important for Dr. Lecter's medical joke? Well, that's because these three things right here, liver, fava beans, and in general wine or liquor, in this case Chianti, these foods and beverages contain a lot of tyramine. Let's think about that for a second. If you're consuming these three things, liver, fava beans, and Chianti, you're getting more tyramine from the diet. In fact, you're getting excess tyramine uh, through the diet. But if you were also taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, then this tyramine that's coming from these three dietary sources is not going to be able to be degraded. So in this case, you're sort of doubly affecting the ability of tyramine to be cleared from the body. One is through this inhibitor. You're not allowing it to be degraded. And then second, you're getting all this excessive tyramine from the diet. So that being said, individuals who have to take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor have dietary restrictions. So these types of foods, those that contain lots of tyramine, are contraindicated, meaning if you were ever prescribed a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, you are not permitted to eat these foods or drinks. Why? Because this inhibitor is inhibiting the enzyme that degrades tyramine. So you're already going to have issues getting rid of tyramine, and if you're getting these from the diet, well, you're in serious trouble because those tyramine levels are going to go up and you're going to have these problems down here on the bottom left. 
So in the end, what does this joke mean? Well, monoamine oxidase inhibitors can be used to treat psychiatric disorders and personality disorders. Dr. Lecter was a psychiatrist, so he certainly knows this and he knows the contraindications for a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. The fact that he's eating these three foods is indicative that he's not taking his meds. If he was taking his meds, which might include a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, then he would end up with tyramine overload because he's also eating these three things. But he's not in tyramine overload, so the only way that can be is if he's not taking this inhibitor, he's not taking his meds. That way, this enzyme is functional and tyramine is able to be degraded. Additionally, it should also be noted that in the book off of which the movie was based, Dr. Lecter actually said Amarone as the type of wine he was drinking instead of Chianti. And it's notable here because apparently, I'm no expert, but Amarone would be a much better fit for going with liver than Chianti would be. And this demonstrates his sophistication, his intelligence, and really strengthens just how psychopathic he is. In addition to just eating a human liver, emphasis on human, well, he's going to pair it with the proper wine. So hopefully this video gave you a good in-depth understanding of this joke from the movie, which is arguably one of the most famous lines from it. And as soon as you get back from the... Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.